Albin awoke from a troubled sleep and found it was still dark. He was thankful, though. He'd had another bad dream and preferred to stay awake. There was nothing fanciful about his recent nightmares. They were memories, which he tried very hard to suppress. They were memories, which he tried very hard to suppress, but which still found a way to torment him while he slept. Memories of his capture and imprisonment by the vile warlord Bargar, who was responsible for the death of his two closest friends, and who had kept Alban chained in a filthy cell, starving and torturing him for his own amusement. He had been lucky to escape alive, thanks to the timely arrival of Valerie. She had rescued him from certain death, despite the fact that he'd spoken rudely and abusively to her beforehand. But she was a much better person than he had been to her, and she had carried him away from Bargar's clutches and deep into the woods, where she cleaned his wounds, fed him, and restored him to his old self. It was during that moment that he had fallen in love with her, while she nestled him in her tender hands and let him lie down on her soft chest. It was the same chest that he was lying on now, as she lay sleeping upon a vast bed in her chambers on the castle's upper floor. Only very rarely did the two of them sleep apart. Each night, Valerie took her tiny beloved husband, undressed him completely, and lay him down between her ample breasts. He felt himself completely immersed in her essence, and he couldn't imagine feeling safer than he did whenever she kept him close to her heart. When he was alone with her up here, he could surrender himself completely to her and let her do whatever she wished to him. He had no fear that she would abuse her power over him, however. She was the most considerate lover, playful in bed and willing to experiment with new techniques for lovemaking. Experimentation being the best way to describe it. But never at the cost of making him feel uncomfortable or unsafe. She enjoyed being the dominant one in their relationship, in bed or elsewhere. But she never made him feel inferior or unequal to her. Alban managed to wriggle his way out from beneath her breasts and walked up towards the base of her neck. Her chest beneath his feet undulated as she breathed, unperturbed by his insignificant weight. But suddenly she began to breathe more rapidly, and her chest began to heave up and down in quick succession. Alban tried in vain to keep his footing, before he was thrown from her torso as she suddenly sat upright, shrieking. He himself barely had time to scream as he flew through the air, before landing unharmed in a fold of the bed's blankets. Valerie sat up and gasped for air at that moment, before instinctively placing her hand on her breast to feel if her husband was all right. <gasps> Alban! She cried out, after realizing he was gone. Alban, darling, where are you? Over here! Came a muffled voice from somewhere in a pile of blankets. I'm all right. I'm not hurt. J just get me out of here, will ya? She quickly stuck her hand in the folded fabric and pulled him out then kissed him and pressed him against her bosom, apologizing for what had happened. I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to scream like that, she said, holding him tightly. It's just a nightmare. Oh, it was horrible. You too, huh? Alban replied. Then, when she looked at him inquiringly, he continued. It's the same nightmare I keep having, sweetheart. You know it by now. I'd still be trapped in it for real if it hadn't been for you. Don't worry about me. It'll keep coming to me before long. It's already beginning to fade. The longer I stay with you. But I can't remember you ever having a bad dream before. It's not going to be a regular thing from now on, is it? I... I don't know. I, I really don't know. Do you want to talk about it? All right, but, but not in here. Come on, I want to get some fresh air. She placed him down on her pillow and lit a candle that stood by her bedside. Then she rose from the bed, giving him a fine view of her shapely unclad body in the flickering candlelight. She quickly put on a simple gown, fur cloak, and slippers. 
Alban didn't bother getting dressed himself. He knew where Valerie wanted to go and that no one would see them there. He also knew that she'd hold him in her hands the whole time, which would keep him safe and warm. Once she was warmly dressed, she picked him up with one hand and the candle in the other and left her bedroom, heading for the castle's one remaining tower which still stood intact. She headed down the hallway outside her room to the winding staircase at the end of it. It led up to the roof of the tower, which wasn't exceptionally high from her point of view, but which soared well over 500 yards from above the ground from the human's perspective. Up here she had put a chair and a small table, making it a nice secluded area where she could sit and think, read, or talk to Alban in private while also giving her an unmatched view of the land surrounding her. Since it was still dark, she didn't spend any time admiring the view, but sat down and placed the candle on the table. Valerie held her husband snug between the fingers of both hands, enjoying the warm feeling of his minuscule nude body against her own skin. She knew that he was a grown man capable of looking after himself and who didn't need her for protection. But whenever she held him like this, she couldn't help but think of him as fragile and in need of her tender care, though she never told him so. She loved him immensely, and she promised herself each day to never let anything bad happen to him. I dreamt about my childhood, back when my father was still the king of this castle. She told him. I dreamt about my childhood, back when my father was still the king of this castle when the giants still rolled over the lands for hundreds of miles around us. It was so long ago for you, I know, but for me, it's still fresh and vivid. As long as I could remember, I hated the thought of harming humans. But my family, my father and brother, the things they had made me see when I was just a child. Alban, I hated every moment I was forced to spend with them. Watching them treat humans like insects murdering them in all kinds of twisted ways, while all the other giants in my father's court cheered them on and even took part in the horrid affair? Valerie, none of that was your fault. No one here blames you for the things that happened hundreds of years ago. I know, but if they did, I would understand. They say that the giants, my people, that they were wiped out by a plague centuries ago. Well, I think that's the best thing that could have ever happened to this land. How could they? How could we, as a people, been so cruel, Alban? What made them look at human beings who were so much smaller and defenseless? It made them want to abuse and kill them. I... I don't know, my love, Alban said, trying his best to offer his distraught wife some comfort. At times like this, when she needed his emotional support, he wished he was as tall as she was, that he could sit next to her and wrap his arms around her, and let her lay her head down on his shoulder. But he couldn't, so he hugged her thumb instead and kissed her over and over again. Cruelty exists in humans too, he continued. We can be just as vicious to our kind as the giants were to us. It was just easier for them since we couldn't fight back. You have nothing to apologize for. You've told me many times how you did everything you could to help humans back in those days. And just look at how many people you're helping right now. How many families with children who had nowhere else to go, for whom you've created a new life and a new home here. This is just the beginning too. Wasn't that what you told me the other day? I think, my dearest wife, that the good that you do in this world will be so much more than you can imagine right now. Oh, Alban, now you're just being melodramatic, but thank you. She lifted his head up to her lips and kissed him long and slowly, savoring every second. I just wish that there had been others back then, other giants who thought like I did, whom I could relate to. Yes, I've seen how humans can be cruel, but so many of you are not. And I have never met another giant who didn't think of humans as disposable playthings, or even worse. But don't forget, you've also had a very sheltered life, Valerie. 
You told me how you were almost never allowed outside the castle. Who can say what the giants who didn't belong in the royal court thought? Perhaps some of them, perhaps many even, shared your views on humans. Perhaps, yes. Maybe you're right. And maybe, maybe some of them are still alive today, living far away where the plague, if that's what it was, couldn't reach them. Maybe someday they'll return home. But until that day, I'll do what I can to restore the people's faith in me. My size and strengths are gifts, and I will use them the best I can to make sure that the cruelty, terror, oppression, and war have no place here in Van Dan. She kissed Albin once more, then slipped him in underneath the bust of her dress, so that he lay snugly between the gown's fabric and the bare skin of her breast. She could feel his feet touching her nipple, and knew that he was probably getting very aroused right now. She herself was on the verge of returning to bed for some more lovemaking with her little man. But when she saw that the eastern sky was beginning to grow lighter, she decided to stay up here and watch the sunrise instead. So she took Albin out again, against his protests, and set him down on her shoulder. Although he was naked, he could easily cover himself by wrapping his entire body up in her long hair. Together, they watched as the sun rose over the serene landscape of Van Dan, no longer the land of dread and terror it had once been, in an age long ago. I think I'd like to do something special for our people, Albin. Valerie said as she headed down the stairs and back inside the castle. Something that'll show them just how much they mean to me. Something that'll make them feel more at home here. What do you have in mind? Albin asked. Oh, I don't know. It's something where I can invite them all to the castle and get to meet some of them in person. Not a great festival or a ball. Something like that would be too grand. And I just don't have the time or patience to organize and prepare such an event. But I'll give it some thought and see what's practical. That will have to wait, though. Right now, it's time for a bath and a nice breakfast. I can't wait. Your hair feels lovely when I'm wrapped in it like this. But it's a bit lacking when it comes to keeping away the cold. <laughs> you just have to make a fuss about everything, don't you, sweetie? Come over here, and I'll keep you warm. She plucked him out of her hair and put him feet first into her open mouth. Albin protested again, but with his head pressed tightly between her lips, there was nothing he could do about it. So he resigned himself to the situation and waited patiently until his wife took him out once she prepared her bath. He knew she was only playfully teasing him, and that she'd reward him by letting him explore all over her body while she bathed. He also hoped fervently that no word of the intimate activities he and Valerie got to when they were alone in the castle would ever spread outside its walls. Five days later, Valerie invited all of the people of Rismark to the special event she planned. It was a huge feast held in the castle's throne room, which had been specially decorated for the occasion. Seven gigantic tables were arranged in a semicircle, and upon them had been placed a multitude of human-sized tables and chairs, providing enough room for 500 guests to sit at. Even more people showed up than she'd planned for, but there were no more chairs to be found anywhere so they had to be content with sitting on the giant tables themselves. Great candles the size of small trees stood on the tables, providing ample light for the occasion. Each table also had a huge wooden ramp fitted which led down to the floor, so that visitors could come and go as they pleased, and which also freed Valerie from the task of having to lift the hundreds and hundreds of arrivals up to the tabletops herself. Finally, she'd placed a row of small boulders around the perimeter of each giant table to prevent anyone from getting too close to the edge and accidentally falling off. She'd handled most of the preparations herself, since she was the only one strong enough to move boulders and supersize furniture around so easily. She also did most of the cooking for the feast. This mostly consisted of fruits and vegetables from her garden, all of them from giant-sized plants which meant that there would be more than enough to feed the whole town. 
Sadly, there were no longer any giant livestock or poultry to be found in Van Dan, so the meat had to be procured from the many farmers who had settled in the area and brought their animals with them. Valerie paid the farmers more than enough gold for all of the livestock that she needed for the feast. And since she also prepared all of the meat dishes for the occasion as well, she still considered it a gift to the people. As for the drinks, she left that up to the subjects to provide for themselves. Though there were giant grapevines in her garden, she didn't know how to make wine from them, and she had never been fond of drinking it. On the evening of the feast, Valerie sat on her throne in the center of the room and watched as throngs of people began to arrive, making their way onto the tables via the ramps. Alban sat on her shoulder as usual, although he planned on joining the guests soon enough. Once a large enough number of people had arrived, Valerie stood up and raised her hands to silence the crowd. She was only partially successful, but it didn't really matter. Her voice was clear and powerful enough for everyone in the enormous room to hear her. Wearing a voluminous white royal gown with golden embroidered patterns on it, she was a magnificent commanding presence and she soon had everyone's attention. Welcome everyone to this evening of celebration, she said. I have not met most of you in person, and a few that I have I have not known for very long. So I have decided to invite all of you, the citizens of Van Dan, my subjects, to this feast. I know that for many of you, moving here with your families and leaving behind the life you had has not been an easy decision to make. I also know that many of you are still fearful and distrustful of me. Having seen firsthand how my own people treated humans long ago, I don't blame you for your fear. But beginning tonight, I hope to be able to get to know you a bit better, and for you to know me better as well. More people are arriving in Van Dan every day, so a feast this great will not be possible much longer. That is why tonight it is important. I hope that you will all enjoy yourselves, and that you will come to know many of your new neighbors and that you will return home tonight knowing that there is nothing I won't do for you as your new ruler to ensure that your lives are as peaceful and fruitful. There were cheers and toasts to her health from many of the tables. But as Valerie had predicted, most of the guests remained silent or simply resumed talking amongst themselves. But she wasn't disheartened. She sat Alban down on the nearest table, where many of his own family members and other upper-class folk from Elgon who had moved there were sitting, and he took a seat amongst them. She, on the other hand, picked up a nearby chair and went and sat at the furthest table. The people on it were not so well off, but instead were mostly poor peasants, those who had lost their homes, belongings, and families in the wars or else who had grown up on the streets of the cities of Elgon in the worst of poverty. For many of them, a meal like this consisted of more food than they were used to eating in a week in their old lives. As she talked to her guests while they ate and answered their questions, Valerie realized that her own childhood years, difficult and traumatizing as they had been, didn't represent the only kind of bad experience a person could have. Now faced with the task of providing a new and better life for hundreds of people, she had suddenly felt out of her depth. She was still so young and inexperienced, and no wiser than a child in many areas. But she didn't want to give up on her dream now. With the help of her loving husband, and with the skills and knowledge of all of the men and women who had come to Van Dan so far, and those still to come, she would try her best to create the greatest kingdom the world had ever known.